the animating ideas of idealism, the semantics and online contango. Today, or I guess in a moment, he'll be speaking on autonomy, community, and freedom. And at 3.30 after a coffee break and questions, uh, he'll be speaking about reason, history, and reality. My theme last time was the innovative normative conception of intentionality that I see lying at the heart of Kant's thought about the mind. He understands judging and willing as taking on distinctive kinds of responsibility. And he understands what one endorses by doing that, judgeable contents and practical maxims, in terms of what one is committing oneself to do, the kind of task responsibility one is taking on. The practical activity one is obliging oneself to engage in by judging and acting is integrating those new commitments into a unified whole, comprising all the other commitments one acknowledges. What makes it a unified whole is the rational relations among its parts. One is obliged to resolve material incompatibilities that one finds among one's commitments by rejecting or modifying some of the offending elements. That's one's critical obligation. And one is obliged to acknowledge commitments to the material inferential consequences of one's commitments. That's one's ampliative obligation. Engaging in those integrative activities is synthesizing a self or subject, which shows up as what is responsible for the component commitments into which it's articulated. Kant's core pragmatist commitment consists in his methodological strategy of understanding what one is in this sense responsible for or committed to the contents of one's judgings and willings, in terms of the role they play in what one is responsible for doing, namely criticizing and amplifying one's commitments. So those commitments must determine the relations of material incompatibility and inferential consequences in which they stand to one another. The rules that settle those rational relations are the concepts one's count, one counts as applying in judging or willing, which activities accordingly show up as endorsings of specifically discursive, that is, conceptual contents. We saw that in taking two commitments to be materially incompatible or to stand in material inferential consequential relations, one is in effect taking them to refer to or represent one and the same object, to attribute to that object properties that exclude or include one another, that is, that are themselves incompatible or stand in a consequential relation. As a result, the synthetic integrative process, with its aspects of critical and ampliative activity, what Hegel with characteristic imagery talks about as the exhaling and inhaling that maintain the rational organic unity and integrity of the subject, provides the basis for understanding both the subjective and the objective poles of the intentional nexus. Subjects are what repel incompatible commitments in that they ought not to endorse them. And objects are what repel incompatible properties in that they cannot exhibit them. Subjects are obliged to endorse the consequences of their commitments, and objects necessarily exhibit the properties that are consequences of their properties. On this account, there's an intimate connection grounded in the fundamental process or activity of rational synthesis or integration between the vertical semantic intentional relations between representing subjects and represented, represented objects on the one hand, and the horizontal deontic normative relations among subjective commitments and alethic modal relations among objective properties on the other. The way I've told this bit of the story perhaps owes more to what Hegel makes of Kant's thought than to Kant's own understanding of it. But Kant himself did, as no one before him had, connect deontic and alethic modalities as pure concepts expressing related species of necessity practical and natural necessity, respectively. For Kant read Hume's practical and theoretical philosophies as raising variants of a single question. On the side of practical reasoning, Hume asks what our warrant is from moving from descriptions of how things are to prescriptions of how they ought to be. How can we rationally justify the move from is to ought? On the side of theoretical reasoning, Hume asks what our warrant is for moving from descriptions of what in fact happens to characterizations of what must happen and what could not happen. How can we rationally justify the move from descriptions of matter of factual regularities to formulations of necessary laws? In Kant's terminology, these are both kinds of necessity, practical and natural necessity, 
because for him, necessary, notwendig, just means according to a rule. Hume's predicament is that he finds that even his best understanding of facts doesn't yield an understanding of either of the two sorts of rules governing and relating those facts. Underwriting assessments of which of the things that actually happen, something we can directly experience, ought to happen, are normatively necessary, or must happen, are naturally necessary. Kant's response to the proposed predicament is that we can't be in the position that Hume envisages, understanding matter of factual empirical claims and judgments perfectly well, but having no idea what's meant by modal or normative ones. To judge, claim, or believe that the cat is on the mat, one must have at least a minimal practical ability to sort material inferences in which that content is involved, as a premise or a conclusion, into good ones and bad ones, and further to discriminate what is from what is not materially incompatible with it. And part of doing that is associating with those inferences ranges of counterfactual robustness. Distinguishing collateral beliefs functioning as auxiliary hypotheses that would, from those that would not, infirm the inference. So for example, one must have such dispositions as to treat the cats being on the mat as compatible with a nearby tree being somewhat nearer, or the temperature a few degrees higher, but not with the sun being as close as the tree, or the temperature being thousands of degrees higher. One must know such things as that the cat might chase the mouse or flee from a dog, but that the mat can do neither, and that the mat would remain essentially as it is if one jumped up and down on it or beat it with a stick, while the cat would not. It's not that there's any one of those counterfactual inferences that's necessary for understanding what it is for the cat to be on the mat, but if one makes no distinctions of this sort, treats the possibility of the cat's jumping off the mat or yawning as on a par with its sprouting wings and starting to fly, or suddenly becoming microscopically small, does not at all distinguish between what can and cannot happen to the cat and what can and cannot happen to the mat, then one doesn't count as understanding the claim well enough to endorse it, in any sense save the derivative parasitic one in which one can believe of a sentence in Turkish, which one does not at all understand that it's true. Sellers puts this Kantian point well in the title of one of his essays, Concepts as Involving Laws and Inconceivable Without Them. I think that's a wonderful title. Unfortunately, the 100-page essay that follows it is completely unintelligible, but, but the title is wonderful. If that's right, then in being able to employ concepts such as cat and mat in ordinary empirical descriptive claims, one already knows how to do everything one needs to know how to do in order to deploy concepts such as possible and necessary, albeit fallibly and imperfectly. Grasp of what's made, implicit, what's made explicit by judgments formed using those alethic modal concepts is implicit in and presupposed by grasp of any empirical descriptive concepts. That's what I think Kant means by calling them pure concepts, that is, categories, and saying that our access to them is a priori, in the sense that the ability to deploy them is presupposed by the ability to deploy any concepts, including especially ordinary empirical descriptive concepts. That is, that claim about a prioricity is at base not an epistemological claim, but a semantic one. A central observation of Kant's <clears throat> is that what we might call the framework of empirical description, the commitments, practices, abilities, and procedures that form the necessary practical background within the horizon of which alone it's possible to engage in the cognitive and theoretical activity of describing how things empirically are, essentially involves elements expressible in words that are not descriptions, that do not perform the function of describing how things are. These include, on the objective side, what's made explicit as statements of laws, using alethic modal concepts to relate the concepts applied in descriptions. Kant addresses the question of how we should understand the semantic and cognitive status of those framework commitments. Are they the sort of thing that can be assessed as true or false? If true, do they express knowledge? If they are knowledge, how do we come to know and justify the claims expressing those commitments? Are they in any sense a kind of empirical knowledge? I think the task of crafting a satisfying idiom for discussing these issues and addressing these questions is still largely with us, well into the third century after Kant first posed them. Now upstream from these considerations, in the order of explanation I'm pursuing, <clears throat> 
is Kant's normative understanding of mental activity on both the theoretical and the practical side. His taking judging and endorsing a practical maxim both to consist in committing oneself, taking on distinctive discursive sorts of responsibility. That's what corresponds on the subjective side to the framework elements made explicit on the objective side in terms of a lethic modal vocabulary. In my first lecture, I suggested that this idea about the centrality of normativity is the axis around which all of Kant's thought should be understood to turn, and that in light of that, understanding the nature of the bindingness of conceptual norms becomes a central philosophical task. That's the topic of this lecture. An integral element of Kant's normative turn is his radically original conception of freedom. His theory is unusual, though not unprecedented, in putting forward a conception of positive rather than negative freedom. That is, it's a conception of freedom to do something rather than freedom from some kind of constraint. Freedom, for Kant, is a distinctive kind of practical ability. What is unprecedented and new, I think, is the way he thinks about that ability. The philosophical tradition, especially in its empiricist limb, had understood the issues clustering around the notion of human freedom in alethic modal terms. Determinism asserted the necessity of intentional performances given non-intentionally specified antecedent conditions. The freedom of an intentional action was thought of in terms of the possibility of the agents having done otherwise. The question was how to construe the subjection of human conduct to laws of the sort that govern the natural world. For Kant, though, those categories apply to the objective side of the intentional nexus, the domain of represented objects. Practical freedom is an aspect of the spontaneity of discursive activity on the subjective side, the domain of representing subjects. The modality that characterizes and articulates this dimension is not alethic, but deontic. What's distinctive of it is not being governed by laws, but by conceptions of laws, that is, by normative attitudes. Kant's conception of freedom, too, is a normative one. Spontaneity, in Kant's usage, is the capacity to deploy concepts. Deploying concepts is making judgments and endorsing practical maxims. Doing that, we've seen, is committing oneself, undertaking a distinctive kind of discursive responsibility. The positive freedom exhibited by exercises of our spontaneity is just this normative ability, the ability to commit ourselves, to become responsible. It can be thought of as a kind of authority, the authority to bind oneself by conceptual norms. That it is the authority to bind oneself means that it involves a correlative sort of responsibility. That the norms in question are conceptual norms means that the responsibility involved in exercising that sort of authority is a rational responsibility. And we've seen that it's a kind of practical responsibility, the responsibility to do something. It's the responsibility to integrate the commitment one has undertaken with others that serve as reasons for or against it. Kantian positive freedom is the rational capacity to adopt normative statuses. To get an intuitive sense of how such a, a capacity could sensibly be thought of as a kind of positive freedom, it's helpful to think of an example considered by the guiding metaphor of Kant's popular essay, Was ist Aufklärung? Consider what happens when a young person achieves her legal majority. Suddenly she has the authority to bind herself legally, for instance, by entering into contracts. That gives her a host of new abilities, to borrow money, take out a mortgage, start a business. The new authority to bind oneself normatively, to take on these new normative statuses, involves a huge increase in positive freedom. The difference between discursive creatures and non-discursive ones is likewise to be understood in terms of the sort of normative positive freedom exhibited by concept users. Further, this sort of normative positive freedom is a kind of rational freedom. For the exercise of that spontaneity is rational activity. Rationality in this sense does not consist in knowers and agents generally, or even often, actually having good reasons for what they believe and do. It consists rather in just being in the space of reasons, in the sense that knowers and agents count insofar as they exercise their normative authority to bind themselves by conceptual norms, undertake discursive commitments and responsibilities, so to make themselves liable to distinctive kinds of normative assessment. <coughs> 
for they're liable to assessment as to the goodness of their reasons for exercising that authority as they do, for taking on those specific commitments and responsibilities. Assessment of those reasons is assessment of their success at integrating the new commitments with others they have similarly adopted and acknowledged. Whatever the actual causal antecedents of their judgings and intentional doings, Kantian knowers and agents are obliged, committed, to have reasons for their judgments and actions. This is the rational justificatory obligation, which is a kind of resultant of the critical and ampliative obligation that I already mentioned. On this account, far from being incompatible with constraint, freedom consists in a kind of constraint, constraint by norms. That sounds paradoxical, but it's not. The positive freedom that Kant is describing, is describing is the practical capacity to be bound by discursive norms. That's a capacity that's compatible with but extends beyond being bound by the laws that govern natural beings. It's by exercising this capacity that we raise ourselves above the merely natural and become beings who live and move and have our being in the normative space of commitments and responsibilities. And so, because it's the rational relations they stand in that articulate the contents of those normative statuses, the space of reasons. The aspiration to become entitled to a conception of normative positive freedom along these lines makes all the more urgent the philosophical project of understanding normative statuses such as commitment, responsibility, and authority. One of the permanent intellectual achievements and great philosophical legacies of the Enlightenment and maybe just the most important contribution modern philosophers have ever made to the wider culture, is the development of secular conceptions of legal, political, and ultimately moral normativity. In the place of traditional appeals to authority, derived ultimately from divine commands, thought of as ontologically based on the status of the heavenly Lord as creator of those he commands, Enlightenment philosophers conceived of kinds of responsibility and authority commitment and entitlement that derive rather from the practical attitudes of human beings. So for instance, in social contract theories of political obligation, normative statuses are thought of as instituted by the intent of individuals to bind themselves on the model of promising or entering into a contract. Political authority is understood as ultimately derived from its perhaps only implicit acknowledgement by those over whom it's exercised. This movement of thought is animated by a revolutionary new concept of the relations between normative statuses and the attitudes of human beings who are the subjects of such statuses, the ones who commit themselves, undertake responsibilities, exercise authority, and who attribute or take themselves and others to exhibit those statuses. This is the idea that normative statuses are attitude dependent. It's the idea that authority, responsibility, and commitment were not features of the non or the pre-human world. They didn't exist until human beings started taking or treating each other as authoritative, responsible, committed, and so on. That is, until they started adopting normative, state, normative attitudes towards one another. Those attitudes and the social practices that made adopting them possible institute the normative statuses in a distinctive sense that it's the principal task of philosophy to investigate and elucidate. This view of the global attitude dependence of norms contrasts with the traditional objectivist one, according to which the norms that determine what's fitting in the way of human conduct are to be read off features of the non-human world that are independent of the attitudes of those subject to the norms. On that picture, the job of the human normative subject is to conform their attitudes what they take to be correct or appropriate conduct to those attitude independent norms to discover and acknowledge the objective normative facts on the practical side just as they're obliged to discover and acknowledge objective non-normative facts on the theoretical side. Kant identifies himself with this enlightenment uh, with this tradition in that he embraces the enlightenment commitment to the attitude dependence of basic normative statuses. One of his big ideas is that that idea can be exploited, that thought can be exploited to provide a criterion of demarcation for the normative. To be entitled to a normative conception of positive freedom as discursive spontaneity, Kant has to be able to distinguish the normative constraint characteristic of knowing and acting subjects 
from the causal, alethic modal constraint, characteristic of the objects they know about and act on. In his terms, he must be able to distinguish constraint by conceptions of laws from constraint by laws. What's the difference between adopting a normative status and coming to be in a natural state? What's the difference between how norms and causes bind those who are subject to them? Following his hero Rousseau, Kant radicalizes the Enlightenment discovery of the attitude dependence of normative statuses into an account of what's distinctive of normative bindingness according to a model of autonomy. This model and the criterion for demarcating normative statuses from natural properties that it embodies is intended as a successor conception to the traditional model of obedience of a subordinate to the commands of a superior. On that traditional conception, one's normative statuses are determined by one's place in the great feudal chain of normative subordination, which may itself be thought of either as an objective feature of the natural and indeed supernatural world, or is itself determined normatively by some notion of the deserts of those ranked according to their asymmetric authority over and responsibility to one another. The contrasting autonomy idea is that we, as subjects, are genuinely normatively constrained only by rules we constrain ourselves by, those that we adopt and acknowledge as binding on us. Merely natural creatures, as objects, are bound only by rules in the form of laws whose bindingness is not at all conditioned by their acknowledgement of those rules as binding on them. The difference between non-normative compulsion and normative authority is that we're genuinely normatively responsible only to what we acknowledge as authoritative. In this sense, only we can bind ourselves, in the sense that we're only normatively bound by the results of exercises of our freedom, self-bindings, commitments we have undertaken by acknowledging them. And that's to say that the positive freedom to adopt normative statuses, to be responsible or committed, is the same as the positive freedom to make ourselves responsible by our attitudes. So Kant's normative conception of positive freedom is a freedom as a kind of authority. Specifically, it consists in our authority to make ourselves rationally responsible. The capacity to be bound by norms and the capacity to bind ourselves by norms are one and the same. That they are one and the same is what it is for it to be norms that we're bound by in virtue of binding ourselves by them. Here, authority and responsibility are symmetric and reciprocal, constitutive features of the normative subject who is at once authoritative and responsible. This whole constellation of ideas about normativity, reason, and freedom, initiated by Kant and developed by his successors, is, I think, what Heidegger means when he talks about the dignity and spiritual greatness of German idealism. Now in my first lecture, I suggested that Kant's rejection of the traditional classificatory theory of consciousness and the need for both a new theory of judging and of what is judged resulted from considering the distinction between pragmatic force and semantic content, the act of judging and judgeable content, as it shows up in the context of compound forms of judgment. That same distinction now combines with the autonomy thesis, which is a thesis about force, about what one is doing in judging, to yield a demand for the relative independence of force and content. content. Attitude dependence of force turns out to require attitude independence of content. The Kant Rousseau autonomy criterion of demarcation of the normative tells us something about normative force, about the nature of the bindingness or validity of the discursive commitments undertaken in judging or acting intentionally. That force, it tells us, is attitude dependent. But it's important to realize that such an approach can only work if it's paired with an account of the contents that normative force is invested in that construes those contents, and in that sense, the normative statuses whose contents they are, as attitude independent. The autonomy criterion says that it's in a certain sense up to us, it depends on our activities and attitudes, whether we are bound by, responsible to, a particular conceptual norm. However, if not only the normative force, but also the contents of those commitments, 
what we're responsible for were also up to us, then to paraphrase Wittgenstein, whatever seems right to us would be right. And in that case, talk of what's right or wrong would get no intelligible grip. No norm would have been brought to bear. No genuine commitment undertaken. No normative status instituted. Put another way, autonomy, binding oneself by a norm, rule, or law, has to have two components corresponding to the autos and the nomos. One must bind oneself, but one must also bind oneself. If not only that one is bound by a certain norm, but also what that norm involves, what's correct or incorrect according to it, is up to the one endorsing it, the notion that one is bound, that a distinction has been put in place between what's correct and incorrect according to that norm, is going to go missing. The attitude dependence of normative force, which is what the autonomy thesis asserts, is intelligible only in a context in which the boundaries of the content, what I acknowledge as constraining me, and by that acknowledgement make into a normative constraint on me, in the sense of opening myself up to normative assessments according to it, are not in the same way attitude dependent. That's just a condition of making the notion of normative constraint intelligible. We can call it the requirement of the relative independence of normative force and content. Now Kant secures this necessary division of labor by appeal to concepts as rules that determine what's a reason for what, and so what falls under the concept so articulated. His picture of empirical activity as consisting in the application of concepts, of judging and acting as consisting in the endorsement of propositions and maxims, strictly separates the contents endorsed from the acts of endorsing them. The latter is our responsibility, the former is not. The judging or acting empirical consciousness always already has available a stable of completely determinate concepts. Its function is to choose among them, picking which ones to invest its authority in by applying them to objects, hence which conceptually articulated responsibility to assume, which discursive commitments to undertake. Judging that what I see up ahead is a dog, applying that concept in perceptual judgment, may initially be successfully integratable into my transcendental unity of apperception, in that it's not incompatible with any of my other commitments. But subsequent empirical experience may normatively require me to withdraw that characterization and apply instead the concept fox. That's my activity and my responsibility. But what other judgments are compatible with something being a dog or a fox is not at that point up to me. It's settled by the contents of those concepts, by the particular rules that I've chosen to apply. Now in taking this line, Kant's adopting a characteristic rationalist order of explanation. It starts with the idea that empirical experience presupposes the availability of determinate concepts. For apperception, awareness in the sense required for sapience, awareness that can have cognitive significance, is judgment, the application of concepts. Even classification of something particular as of some general kind counts as awareness only if the general kind one applies is a concept, that is, something whose application can both serve as and stand in need of reasons, constituted by the application of other concepts. When an iron pipe rusts in the rain, it is in some sense classifying its environment as being of a certain general kind, but it's in no interesting sense aware of it. On this line, then, one must already have concepts in order to be aware of anything at all. Of course, this is just the point at which the pre-Kantian rationalists notoriously faced the problem of where determinate concepts come from. If they're presupposed by experiential awareness, then it seems they can't be thought of as derived from it, for instance, by abstraction. Once the normative apperceptive enterprise is up and running, further concepts may be produced or refined by various kinds of judgments. For instance, the reflective judgments Kant talks about in the third critique. But concepts must always already be available for judgment and hence apperception to take place at all. Empirical activity, paradigmatically apperception in the form of judgment, presupposes transcendental activity, which is the rational criticism and rectification of one's commitments, making them into a normatively coherent unified system. Defining that normative unity requires the availability of concepts with already determinate contents, that is, roles in reasoning. Leibniz's appeal to innateness is not an attractive response to the resulting explanatory demand, and it wouldn't be much improvement to punt the central issue 
of the institution of conceptual norms from the realm of empirical into the realm of noumenal activity? I think it's a nice question just how Kant's account deals with this issue. In fact, as I read him, Hegel criticizes Kant on just this point. He sees Kant as having been uncharacteristically but culpably uncritical about the origin and nature of the determinate contents of empirical concepts. Hegel's principal innovation is his idea that in order to follow through on Kant's fundamental insight into the essentially normative character of mind, meaning, and rationality, we need to understand the normative statuses. We need to recognize that normative statuses, such as authority and responsibility, are at base social statuses. He broadens Kant's account of synthesizing normative individual selves or subjects, unities of apperception, by the activity of rational integration into an account of the simultaneous synthesizing of normative individual selves or subjects and their communities by practices of reciprocal recognition. How does this response fit into the space of possibilities defined by the considerations that I've been putting forward as motivating Kant? Well, the problem, recall, is set by a tension that I've diagnosed between the autonomy model of normative bindingness which is a way of working out and filling in the enlightenment commitment to the attitude dependence of normative statuses, on the one hand, and the requirement that the contents by which autonomous subjects bind themselves be at least relatively attitude independent, in the sense that while according to the autonomy thesis, the subject has authority over the judgings, in the sense of which concepts are applied, which judgeable content is endorsed, responsibility is taken for, what one then becomes responsible for must be independent of one's taking responsibility for it, on the other hand. And this is to say that the content itself must have an authority that's independent of the responsibility that the judger takes for it. And the problem is to reconcile that requirement with the autonomy model of the bindingness of normative statuses such as authority. Whose attitudes is the authority of conceptual contents dependent on? The autonomy model says it must be dependent on the attitudes of those responsible to that authority, namely the subjects who are judging and acting, so undertaking commitments with those contents and thereby subjecting themselves to that authority. But the requirement of relative independence of normative force and content forbids exactly that sort of attitude dependence. To resolve this tension, we have to disambiguate the basic idea of the attitude dependence of normative statuses along two axes. First, we can ask, whose attitudes? The autonomy model takes a clear stand here. It's the attitudes of those who are responsible, that is, over whom authority is exercised. This is not the only possible answer. For instance, the traditional subordination model of normative bindingness as obedience, by contrast to which the autonomy view defines itself, can be understood not only in objectivist terms as simply rejecting the attitude dependence of normative statuses, but also in terms compatible with that insight. So understood, it acknowledges the attitude dependence of normative statuses, but insists that it's the attitudes of those exercising authority, the superiors, rather than the attitudes of those over whom it's exercised, the subordinates, that are the source of the bindingness. Hegel actually wants to respect both these thoughts. The trouble with them, he thinks, is that each of them construes the reciprocal notions of authority and responsibility in a one-sided, einseitig way, as having an asymmetric structure that's unmotivated and ultimately unsustainable. If X has authority over Y, then Y is responsible to X. The obedience view sees only the attitudes of X as relevant to the bindingness of the normative relation between them, while the autonomy view sees only the attitudes of Y as mattering. Hegel's claim is that they both do. The problem is to understand how the authority to undertake a determinate responsibility that for Kant is required for an exercise of freedom is actually supplied with a correlative definite responsibility so that one is intelligible as genuinely committing oneself to something, constraining oneself. This coordinate structure of authority and responsibility, independence and dependence in the normative sense that Hegel gives to those terms, is what Hegel's social model of reciprocal recognition is supposed to make sense of. He thinks 
And this is an enlightenment thought of a piece with that which motivates the autonomy criterion of demarcation of the normative, that all authority and responsibility are ultimately social phenomena. They're the products of the attitudes of those who on the one hand undertake responsibility and exercise authority, and on the others of those who hold them responsible and acknowledge their authority. In spite of the formal parity of the models as asymmetric, the modern autonomy model does represent for Hegel a clear advance on the traditional obedience model, in that it does aspire to endorse symmetry of authority and responsibility. But it does so by insisting that those relations of authority and responsibility obtain only when X and Y are identical, when the authoritative one and the responsible one coincide. That immediate collapse of, of roles does achieve symmetry, but only at the cost of making it impossible to satisfy the demand for the relative independence of normative force and content required to make the autonomy criterion uh, intelligible. The next clarificatory question that must be asked about the basic idea of the attitude dependence of normative statuses is, what sort of dependence? In particular, are the attitudes in question sufficient to institute the normative statuses, or are they merely necessary? The stronger sufficiency claim seems to be required to sustain the tension between the autonomy model and the requirement of relative independence of force and content. A moderate version of the normative attitude dependence thesis would reject objectivism by insisting that the notions of responsibility and authority essentially involve, in the sense of being unintelligible apart from, the notion of acknowledging responsibility and authority. One can say that political legitimacy is not possible without the consent of the governed, without thereby being committed to the possibility of reducing legitimacy without remainder to such consent. And a moderate autonomy thesis might treat subjects as responsible only to what they acknowledge as authoritative without dissolving the authority wholly in that acknowledgement. The one-sided obedience view took the attitudes of the superior to be sufficient to institute a normative status of authority and corresponding responsibility on the part of the subordinate. And the one-sided autonomy view took the acknowledgement of responsibility by the one bound to be sufficient to institute the authority by which he's bound. What Hegel sees as wrong about the obedience view is accordingly not that it makes each subject's normative statuses dependent on the attitudes of others but rather that it's asymmetric treatment of those attitudes as sufficient to institute those statuses all by themselves, independently of the attitudes of the ones whose statuses they are. Taking someone to be responsible or authoritative, attributing a normative deontic status to someone, is an attitude that Hegel, picking up a term of Fichte's, called recognition, anerkennung. Hegel's view is what you get if you take the attitudes both of recognizer and recognized, both of those who are authoritative and of those who are responsible, to be essential necessary conditions of the institution of genuine normative statuses, and require in addition that those attitudes be symmetric or reciprocal, gegenseitig. In a certain sense, which it'll be my business to investigate more closely in the next lecture, Hegel also takes it that those individually necessary normative attitudes are jointly sufficient to institute normative statuses. What institutes normative statuses is reciprocal recognition. Someone becomes responsible only when others hold him responsible and exercises authority only when others acknowledge that authority. One has the authority to petition others for recognition in an attempt to become responsible or authoritative. To do that, one must recognize them as being able to hold one responsible or acknowledge one's authority. This is according them a kind of authority. To achieve such statuses, one must be recognized by them in turn. And that's to make oneself in a certain sense responsible to them. The process that synthesizes an apperceiving normative subject, one who can commit himself in judgment and action, become responsible cognitively and practically, is a social process of reciprocal recognition that at the same time synthesizes a normative recognitive community of those recognized by and who recognize that normative subject, a community bound together by reciprocal relations of authority over and responsibility to each other. Here's a mundane example. 
Achieving the status of being a good chess player is not something I can do simply by subjectively coming to adopt a certain attitude towards myself. It is, in a certain sense, up to me, whom I regard as good chess players. Whether I count any wood pusher who can play a legal game, only formidable club players, masters, or grandmasters. That is, it is up to me, whom I recognize as good chess players, in the sense in which I aspire to be a good chess player. But it's not then in the same sense up to me whether I qualify as one of them. To earn their recognition in turn, I have to be able to play up to their standards. To be, say, a formidable club player, I must be recognized as such by those I recognize as such. My recognitive attitudes can define a virtual community, but only the reciprocal recognition by those I recognize can make me actually a member of it, accord me the status for which I've implicitly petitioned by recognizing them. My attitudes exercise recognitive authority in determining whose recognitive attitudes I'm responsible to for my actual normative status. Now, I'm not going to go into this here, but for Hegel, uh, a vast story in the vicinity of the Lordship and Bondage section unfolds here. What he calls the causality of fate uh, is something that, uh, again, in a, uh, has to do with this metaphysics of recognition. Uh, another mundane example of that is the sense in which uh, uh, celebrities have uh, uh, are subject to this causality of fate and are in an unsupportable recognitive situation because they are celebrities only by being recognized by people they despise, uh, whose opinions they, they have no reason to, to recognize as authoritative. Uh, and uh, uh, th this idea is very important to, uh, to Hegel, but I'm not going to talk about that. As in the Kantian autonomy model of normative bindingness, we bind ourselves collectively and individually. No one has authority over me except that which I grant by my recognitive attitudes. They are accordingly a necessary condition of my having the status I do. But, as on the traditional obedience model, others do, rec do exercise genuine authority over my normative statuses. In the cases we care about, what I'm committed to, responsible for, and authoritative about. Their attitudes are also a necessary condition of my having the status I do. These two, these two aspects of normative dependence, authority and responsibility, are entirely reciprocal and symmetrical. And together, the attitudes of myself and my fellows in the recognitive community, of those I recognize and who recognize me, are sufficient to institute normative statuses that are not subjective in the same way the normative attitudes that institute them are. Hegel diagnoses the incompatibility of commitment to the attitude dependence of normative statuses, according to the Kantian autonomy model, and the relative independence of normative content from normative force as resulting from the autonomy model's asymmetric insistence on the sufficiency of the attitudes of the committed one to institute the normative status in question, without acknowledging also any normative dependence in the sense of a necessary condition on the attitudes of others. The reciprocal recognition model he recommends to resolve this incompatibility balances the moments of normative independence or authority of attitudes over statuses on the part of both recognizer and recognized with the corresponding moments of normative dependence or responsibility to the attitudes of others by reading both of these aspects as individually only necessary and only jointly sufficient to institute normative statuses in the sense of giving them binding force. For Hegel, social substance is synthesized by reciprocal recognition. It's articulated into individual recognizing and recognized selves, which are the subjects of normative statuses of commitment, authority, and responsibility, statuses instituted collectively by those recognitive attitudes. He sees these social recognitive practices as providing the context and background required to make sense of the Kantian process of integrating conceptual commitments so as to synthesize a rational unity of apperception. Hegel's term for the whole normatively articulated realm of discursive activity, Kant's realm of freedom, is Geist, spirit. And at its core is language. Language is the Dasein of Geist, Hegel says. That's where concepts, which for Hegel as for Kant is to say norms, have their actual public existence. <clears throat> 
to look ahead a little bit, we might think here of Seller's dictum, that grasp of a concept is always mastery of the use of a word. Here's how I think the social division of con conceptual labor understood according to the recognitive model of reciprocal authority and responsibility works in the paradigmatic linguistic case so as to resolve the tension with which we've been concerned. It is up to me which counter in the game I play, which move I make, which word I use. But it's not then in the same sense up to me what the significance of that counter is, what other moves it precludes or makes necessary, what I've said or claimed using that word, what the constraints are on a successful rational integration of the commitment I've thereby undertaken with the rest of those I acknowledge. It is up to me which concept I apply in a particular judgment, whether I claim that the coin is made of copper or silver, for instance. But if I claim that it's copper, it's not then up to me what move I've made, what else I've committed myself to by using that term. So, for instance, I have thereby committed myself to the coin melting at 1,084 degrees C, but not at 1,083 degrees C, in the sense that if those claims aren't true, neither is the one I made. And I've made a claim that's incompatible with saying the coin is an electrical insulator. I can bind myself by these determinate conceptual norms because they're always already there in the always already up and running communal linguistic practices into which I enter as a young one. An essential part of what maintains them is the attitudes of others. In this case, the metallurgical experts who would hold me responsible for those commitments on the basis of my performance if the issue arose. My authority to commit myself using public words is the authority at once to make myself responsible for and authorize others to hold me responsible for determinate conceptual contents about which I am not authoritative. It's a petition for determinate recognition, the attribution of specific commitments by those I implicitly recognize as having and thereby grant the authority so to recognize me. That's granting them the authority to assess the correctness or success of my rational integrative performances. Now the point with which I wish to close <coughs> is that Hegel's social linguistic development of Kant's fundamental insight into the essentially normative character of our mindedness provides a model of positive freedom that while building on his notion of autonomy develops it substantially. One of the central issues of classical political philosophy is how to reconcile individual freedom with the constraint by social, communal, and political norms. Kant's vision of us as rational creatures opens up space for an understanding of a kind of freedom that consists in being able to constrain ourselves by norms, indeed by norms that are rational in the sense that they're conceptual norms, norms that articulate what's a reason for what. The normative conception of positive freedom then makes possible a distinctive kind of answer to the question how the loss of individual negative freedom, freedom from constraint, that's inevitably involved in being subjected to institutional norms, could in principle be rationally justified to the individual. For in the Kantian context, such a justification could in principle consist in a corresponding increase in positive freedom. And here, I think Hegel sees that the positive expressive freedom, the freedom to do something that's obtainable only by constraining oneself by the conceptual norms implicit in discursive social practices, speaking a public language, is a central case where such a justification evidently is available. Speaking a particular language requires complying with a daunting variety of norms, rules, and standards. The result of failure to comply with enough of them is unintelligibility. That fact can fade so far into the background as to be well nigh invisible when we're working in our home language, but it's an obtrusive, unpleasant, and unavoidable feature of working in a language in which one is not at home. Still, the kind of positive freedom one gets in return for constraining oneself in these multifarious ways is distinctive and remarkable. The astonishing empirical observation with which Chomsky inaugurated contemporary linguistic theory 50 years ago is that almost every sentence uttered by an adult native speaker is radically novel. That is, not only has that speaker never heard or uttered just that sequence of words before, but neither has anyone else, ever. Have a nice day may get a lot of play in the States and noch eins in Germany, 
but any tolerably complex sentence is almost bound to be new. Quotation aside, it is, for instance, exceptionally unlikely that anyone else has ever used a sentence chosen at random from the story I've been telling. And that's not just a special property of professor speak. Surveys of large corpora of actual utterances collected and collated by indefatigable graduate students have repeatedly confirmed this empirically. And it can be demonstrated on more fundamental grounds by looking at the number of sentences of, say, 30 words or less that a relatively simple grammar can construct using the extremely minimal 5,000 word vocabulary of basic English. You probably use about 50,000 words in your everyday life. There just hasn't been time in human history for us to have used a substantial proportion even of the true ones, even if every human being there had ever been had always spoken English and did nothing but chatter incessantly. But I have no trouble producing, and you have no trouble understanding, a sentence that in spite of its ordinariness, it's quite unlikely anyone has ever happened to use before, such as, we shouldn't leave for the picnic until, until we're sure that we've packed my old wool blanket, the thermos, and all the sandwiches we made this morning. This capacity for radical semantic novelty fundamentally distinguishes sapient creatures from those who do not engage in linguistic practices. Because of it, we can, and do all the time, make claims, formulate desires, and entertain goals that no one else in the history of the world has ever before so much as considered. This massive positive expressive freedom transforms the lives of sentient creatures who become sapient by constraining themselves by linguistic, which is to say conceptual norms. So in the conceptual normativity implicit in linguistic practice, we have a model of a kind of constraint, a loss of negative freedom, that's repaid many times over in a bonanza of positive freedom. Anyone who was in a position to consider the trade-off rationally would consider it a once-in-a-lifetime bargain. Of course, one need not be a creature like us. As Sellers says, one always could simply not speak, but only at the cost of having nothing to say. And non-sapient sentience are hardly in a position to weigh the pros and cons involved. But the fact remains that there is an argument that shows that at least this sort of normative constraint is rational from the point of view of the individual, that it pays off by opening up a dimension of positive expressive freedom that's a pearl without price, obtainable in principle in no other way. Hegel's idea is that this case provides the model that every other social and political institution that proposes to constrain our negative freedom should be compared to and measured against. The question for him always is, what new kinds of positive expressive freedom? What new kinds of life possibilities? What new kinds of commitment, responsibility, and authority are made possible by this institution? Kant's normative conception of intentionality moves to the center of the philosophical stage, the question of how we should think about the force or bindingness, his Gültigkeit or Verbindlichkeit, of normative statuses, such as commitment, authority, and responsibility. Kant's response is to develop and extend the enlightenment commitment to the attitude dependence of normative statuses in the form of his autonomy model, which serves also as a criterion demarcate, demarcating the realm of the normative from that of the natural. Hegel sees that the very distinction of force and content that called forth Kant's new normative conception of judging and intending demands a relative independence of those two aspects that cannot be accommodated on the autonomy model, so long as that model is construed as applying to individual normative subjects conceived in isolation from one another. That is, apart from their normative attitudes to one another. He notices to begin with that the requisite dependence and independence claims can be reconciled if they're construed in terms of individually necessary conditions rather than individually sufficient ones. And understanding the sort of normative dependence and independence in question as ways of talking about relations of responsibility and authority, he offers a social model of normative statuses as instituted by reciprocal recognition, according to which each recognitive relation, recognizing and being recognized, combines aspects of authority over and responsibility to those who are recognized or who recognize. We've seen how the reciprocal recognition model and criterion of demarcation for normative bindingness underwrites all of a strong version of the enlightenment idea of the attitude dependence of normative statuses, 
since the recognitive attitudes of individual members of a recognitive community, while individually only necessary, are understood as jointly sufficient for the institution of determinately contentful normative statuses of commitment, responsibility, and authority. And how it underwrites a social version of the structure of autonomy, one that incorporates the dependence on or responsibility to the attitudes of others characteristic of the obedience model in the weaker form of merely necessary conditions, since each individual is responsible only for what she's authorized others to hold her responsible for and provision for the relative independence of the content of each commitment from the authority of the one who undertakes the commitment, away statuses outrun attitudes. And finally, we saw how Hegel's distinctively linguistic version of the social recognitive model of normativity opens up a powerful and original notion of positive expressive freedom and normative selfhood as the product of the rationality instituting capacity to constrain oneself by specifically discursive norms.